Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello and welcome. You're joining me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that inspired her the most on her life journey is healer, author, educator, master flower essence practitioner, and certified hypnotherapist, Dina Salisi, who left behind an entertainment career and a lifetime of chronic pain to guide others in creating personal empowerment to overcome physical and emotional challenges by combining these powerful healing modalities together. Dina is author of the book and the card deck, Listening to Flowers, Positive Affirmations to Invoke the Healing Energy of the 38 Bark Flowers. Dina Salisi, welcome. Oh, thank you, Sandy. It is so wonderful and a privilege to be here. It's good to have you, Dina. So tell me about your relationship with books. Wow, books. Um, You know, ever since I can remember being a small child, even, um, books are like friends, right? And so um, like friends and like the people we surround ourselves with, we're always looking for those that uplift, inspire, and I think validate us. So for me, when I was younger and really being um, different, feeling different from definitely the people in my family. Um, I grew up in New Jersey in the 70s where there wasn't really a whole lot of spiritual awareness. The books, um, you know, as I grew older, they really, they validated my way of thinking. And they're great teachers, right? And not only do they teach us about the world around us, but they teach us so much about ourselves. Mm. You know, it's so interesting, that question of pretty much all the guests that come on here. And every single one of them usually starts with something, an expression like you did. It's a kind of, (sighs) wow. It's, you know, it's clear that the pleasure that books bring us is, wow. You know, I I think it's really hard to articulate what they do for us. Mm -hmm. Mm. So Mm -hmm. do you remember the first spiritual book that you ever read? Yeah, so it's actually the first one in my list, and it's Creative Visualization by Shakti Gawain. And at the time, I was about 18 years old and, um, you know, struggling with childhood trauma that I really wasn't completely aware of at the time. But um, something about her book, I stumbled into a metaphysical bookshop in Greenwich Village, and it was the mid 80s. And I picked up this book and I was just blown away with the idea that our thoughts govern our whole life. And, um, you know, again, at the time, there wasn't a lot of support for this way of thinking. So having that book really started me on my path of greater awareness of how I could really shift my story by changing my perception and my perspectives. Mm. Yeah, I think you said at the same day in the same bookshop, you also picked up the essential writings of Dr. Edward Bark, The Twelve Healers and Heal Thyself. That was pivotal in your career. That was pivotal. And it took me, I mean, that was really going back about 40, almost 40 years now. And um, that book I really loved because here was this man who was he was a doctor, you know, he was a scientist. He was pretty straight-laced, really. And then here he was, that he had all this awareness, all this intuitive wisdom in the fact that nature, primarily flowers, were a source of nourishment that we could connect with to really help us to grow, to learn more about ourselves, and to actually use the essence or the energy from 
to transform. And um, again, I was blown away. I carried this book around with me. Um, his descriptions of each flower essence are very simple. They're like one or two sentences long. Like his whole Materia Medica of the 38 flowers is like 30 pages long. So it's a very small book, but it holds so much power and it's really provoked um, like so much. Like now there's hundreds of flower remedy developers, mm -hmm. practitioners, thousands worldwide. And so, um, yeah, it, it catalyzed this greater awareness, which was, of course, ancient wisdom. I mean, I think Hildegard of Bingen was the first European in 1100 to recognize the energy of flowers. And she used, she used to scrape the dew off of the petals and use them to heal people from like serious illnesses. And, uh, you know, her works live on and for almost what, a thousand years, right? Yeah. So this is ancient wisdom that he sort of brought, I mean, it was the 30s, right? So there was a lot of this, um, you know, that was kind of a modern age of like thinking about our inner wisdom and our spirituality in a way that we could truly access it as human beings. And it wasn't just, um, you know, out there as like philosophy. We began in the 30s, I think is in the 20s when we began to bring it more into our physical realm of being. Mm. I have um, a book that I found in a secondhand bookshop, a small, very old book, um, and it is a bit of a biography of Bach. And mm. I never realized, although I've used the remedies for 30, 40 years, I never realized that he actually used them on physical ailments as well. He did. And I think being a doctor, you know, he was uh, grounded in the physical, right? Mm. And then he recognized what he recognized was he could have his patients come in and say they were all dealing with liver ailments um, rather than just giving them the diagnosis and giving them maybe a pill or even an herb to cure it. What he recognized was that there was always a deeper emotional component and that two people with the same illness would have different emotions around it. So he really started treating people on an emotional level. And um, that really like just broadened not only his whole perspective, but it really helped people to heal more deeply. And then they weren't like coming back with other physical illnesses. They were really, you know, creating healing on a deeper metaphysical level. Mm. Um, the third book on your list is another one on bark flower therapy, and it's by uh, Meshtid Schiffer, and um, she's a German flower therapy. I'm, I'm assuming it's a she. Yeah, it's she is a woman. She's, um, she's still alive. She is a German flower therapist, but she's also a psychologist. And so, again, like going back to that validation piece, right? Like what I love about her work is that she's a brilliant woman. Um, she's quite older now. I, I believe she's in her, yeah, I don't want to misspeak, 70s, 80s. Um, but so she really, again, she took the flowers and took the essences. And with her work with clients, um, she really broadened the perspective. So what I love about her book is it really expands on box theories and really talks about like even the subtler, the subtler cues that sometimes we pick up when we're working with clients and um, like what little, what little wisdoms, like what little words they use maybe mean or how they, how they speak, you know, like um, Star of Bethlehem, that's one of the flowers that's in Rescue Remedy and it's used for trauma. And it could work on any trauma, whether it happened yesterday or 20 years ago. I, I've seen it really open up these, these faculties when people are stuck. And so that's one of the things she talks about is like the voice of a person who's in trauma is often monotone. And so when I see somebody coming in to my practice and they talk about the pain that they're experiencing, but they can't cry or they have a very monotone voice and they can't access the emotion. You know, I look towards Star of Bethlehem, but I just love her nuanced perspective on the Bach flowers. Mm. Yeah. Um, book number four, another one on flowers. It's Flowers and Their Messages by the Mother, Mira <laughs> Alfasa. That was published in 1995. And of course, Mother was the guru equal to Sri Aurobindo. Yeah, and what an amazing woman. Um, Mira Afasa, she was a, a French-Egyptian um, Jew, 
actually. She was born in Paris and um, she was definitely a seeker. She was one of those women who was just going to like, she was going to change the world, you know? And again, she was kind of straight laced when she started out. I believe she was married to a, a British uh, or a French politician. And then um, she started having these visions and uh, she heard about Sri Aurobindo and she wanted to go meet with him. So she got an appointment with him. And as soon as she met him, she recognized him as uh, a guru that she had seen in her dreams. And right away, um, they connected. And so much so that Orbindo, you know, dubbed her his spiritual equal. That So they sort of, um, I would say they were each other's gurus. But what I love about um, Mira Alfasa, aka the mother, is that she really, really was in tune with the energy of flowers and she was very certain about it. Like she wasn't woo woo, <laughs> you know, she was very much grounded in this idea of divinity, that we are all divine beings and that our divinity connects with all of the life force energy that we're a part of. And so for her, it was flowers. And um, yeah, I just love her wisdom and her certainty in it. And for me, that really helps me to ground into my own certainty around the healing messages of flowers. So how how is she, um, I haven't seen this book, uh, how is she differing from the other books on flowers? Is she giving re remedies? Is she talking about the various properties that they have? Yeah. yeah, so she more talks about actually being in physical, spiritual connection with actual flowers. She, I don't believe she actually talks about working with flower essence remedies, but mm -hmm. I love the idea that she just talks about the connection with each flower. And so for anybody who works with flowers, energy or for even botanists for that matter, what we do is we're always looking at the physical properties of the flowers, right? First and foremost, like how do they grow? Where do they grow? What do their colors signify? What do their shapes signify? So she was very attuned to that. And of course, you know, kind of correlating the colors with the different chakra systems. And um, she even talks about dried flowers, which I love to dry flowers and I collect the petals and I jar them and use them as like flower confetti. And she talks about how the flowers hold their energy even after they're dried. And I've had this experience where, you know, you can still feel the, the vital life force energy that's in a flower. Mm. Do you um, have a favorite message of hers? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think the divine is, is my big takeaway message with her and with Sri Aurobindo for that matter. His book was The Life Divine and how we are 100% connected. Not only, we're not, not that we're connected to the energy of nature, but that we are a part of it and that nature is the one source that governs and nourishes all energy on the planet. So it is like the one the one love, the one essence that governs us all. And to me, that is connecting with the divine. Is there one flower that is more connected with the divine than others? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, for me, I have a personal favorite, and it's actually one that um, doesn't really have a remedy. Um, it's the hydrangea flower, right? And so this is my personal favorite flower, and I've actually... Um, done provings. Anyone who uses homeopathy knows what a proving is, where I've given groups of people the remedy and I've asked them to take it. And then we met over the course of two months to kind of talk about the different properties of the hydrangea flower. So this is like my personal essence. I've made it. I've created the essence. And, um, you know, I love that it's a flower within a flower. So if you look at a hydrangea all, right? They call them mop heads. They have little tiny flowers that are all connected to one stem, and it could be dozens of flowers on one head. And um, to me, that speaks to the many facets of each being, that we all hold these different facets. And, um, you know, when we're able to integrate them, again, that's, that's proof of the divine. And so for me, like, yeah, hydrangea is this divine um, flower of enlightenment. Mm. Yeah, that's lovely. Uh, book number five, this is a, a little bit different, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogyam Trungpa, um, 2010, this was published. Mm -hmm. So I actually almost 
did not put this book on the list because Chogyam Trungpa was a bit of a controversial character. Um, you know, by the end of his life, it was clear that he was alcoholic and a womanizer. And, um, you know, I think he hurt some people. I think most of all, he hurt himself. But what I love about him and his wisdom and his teachings and this book is that it's very human. So anyone who's ever struggled with addiction um, knows the shadow side of it. And again, we are multifaceted. So we're, we're more than our shadow. We're more than our light. We are all of these things. And so for me, um, you know, his wisdom really holds true as, as being very, you know, uh, shows us the shadow side of humanity. But also there's so much wisdom in it. And he started over 100 medita meditation centers worldwide. He started Vajradhatu, Naropa, um, the Shambhala tradition. So he was a heavy duty player. And um, there's this quote of his that comes from the book that really I feel like encapsulates, you know, why I put it on the list. I'm going to read it. We do not have to be ashamed of what we are. As sentient beings, we have wonderful backgrounds. These backgrounds may not be particularly enlightened or peaceful or intelligent. Nevertheless, we have soil good enough to cultivate. We can plant anything in it. Mm. His books come up quite a few times, um, you know, yeah. have done over the years we've been doing this. And, um, you know, I've heard it said before, People have said, I wondered whether I should include it. Well, of course you should include it because it is a book that inspired you. And the fact is, you know, we have to learn to be discerning. We have to take, you know, the message and not necessarily the messenger, if the messenger doesn't fit for us, but the message does. And we also have to realize that, you know, they're just mirroring back to us the shadow side that we all have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So anyone else who's thinking of uh, uh, contributing their list to this club, you know, don't be afraid to put down whatever did inspire you. So we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, we'll move on to the last five on Dina's list. Stay tuned. Om Times TV. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion, and there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab, and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America.
Welcome back, Dina Salisi. Book number six is Present Moment, Wonderful Moment by Thich Nhat Hanh, with illustrations by Mayomi Oda. Published in 1990. Tell us about this book. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I love all of Thich Nhat Hanh's books. Um, and he he was um, called Tay to his devotees, and um, he just passed in a, uh, about a year, a little more than a year ago. And um, I just love his his clarity, but also his gentleness. That he is like a you know he's gentle, but he's also fierce, right? Like he just has showed so much courage throughout his life. But I think my biggest takeaway um, from this work is you are more than your emotions. Like, like sometimes we get caught up in thinking, you know, I am angry. But no, I'm not angry. I, I might feel angry. I am not angry. And so I just always go back to Tay's wisdom, his little gentle bon mots, like just do each task with mindfulness. mindfulness. And I often think of this, like if I'm sweeping or doing the dishes, like this is part of my life. So why am I going to rush through it? No, I'm going to just take this present moment and treat it as if it's a wonderful moment because all of our moments are, even if they're difficult. And then I also love um, Mayumi Oda. She's an amazing artist whose works I, I cherish. And um, so I just love that she did the illustrations for the books. They just serve to really add more, more clarity and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Book number seven, Start Where You Are. Guide to Compassionate Living by Pema Chodron. That was published in 1994. Yeah, and again, so Pema, um, her her spiritual master was Chogyam Trungpa. So she came from his lineage. And again, like what a real person. Like she wasn't always um, a Buddhist nun. She was a, a mother and a wife. And she went through a divorce. And, and I, she struggled with a lot of issues before she became a nun. And um, again, she has this really um, great, um, great wisdom. Always meditate on whatever provokes resentment. And so um, this was going back about 20 years now. I did a weekend workshop with her at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Northern California. And it was a three-day workshop. And so it was like the first day was short, the second, the third day was short, but the third, the second day was like the full day. And we were going to have, you know, a meditation, then she was going to give a talk, then we were going to do another meditation. So there were, I don't know, uh, maybe 200 of us there sitting on cushions and we did the little morning meditation and then we came back for her talk and we were all like, you know, just kind of relaxing into it. Oh, great. You know, she's going to talk. And she sits down on the cushion and she says, for my talk today, we're going to meditate for 90 minutes. <laughs> and we were like, you just felt the, the fear go through the room. And pissed. We were pissed. We were resentful. We were like, <laughs> what do you mean? We thought we were going to relax and get a, a Dharma talk and now we have to sit more. And nobody was prepared for that. But what I remember was that um, as we sat in this collective energy, that the, the resentment, the anger quelled right away, just having her at the helm. And it was beautiful. It was one of the best meditations I'd ever experienced. And you know what? The 90 minutes went by really quickly. <laughs> yeah, what a great way to have you all meditating on resentment. Yeah. <laughs> stoke, stoke the fire. Um, book number eight, uh, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, A Practical Guide to the Fulfillment of Your Dreams by Deepak Chopra, published in 1993. Yeah, this is a really popular one. Um, I love it because it's small. It's a very small book. Um, I think the first time I read it, I listened to it on a drive and it was like an hour and a half long. Um, but so now I just keep it and I read it like over and over because it's one of those handbooks that has a lot of practical wisdom. And of course, it's all, you know, Dharma wisdom that we've all heard before. But for me, um, I think my favorite law is law number four, which is the law of least effort, the law of least effort. Like who doesn't love that? Like just the, the understanding, the knowing that if I show up and I do my good work, that I don't have to like um, push it or be anxious about what's going to happen. It's really just trusting 
It's about trusting in being and trusting that we already know um, what's guiding us. We're already on the path. All we have to do is show up and trust and do what's right and really not. I, I think sometimes we over effort and that really messes us up. Yeah. So it's just yeah. a lot of yeah. good reminders for living life successfully. Mm. So book number nine, Goddesses in Every Woman. A uh, New Psychology of the Feminine by Jean Shinoda Bolan, published in 1984. I love Jean Shinoda Bolan. She is really, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, one of the, the greatest um, female teachers and wise women of our time. She's still alive. She's about 85, I believe. Um, and yes, I've been fortunate enough to do live workshop with her, to meet with her one-on-one. -on -one. And um, so this book is about our feminine inner archetypes. And when we're talking about the feminine and the masculine, we're talking about our, our soul ways of being that are alive in every human, whether you're a man or a woman, it's not about gender. And so she um, illuminates these goddesses, these Greek goddesses, and she uses them to kind of work with the different archetypes that are alive in each of us for greater awareness and to kind of like figure out like, how do I show up in the world? And, and how does that really kind of contribute to my power? But also how does that Hold me back. So this book was actually given to me as a gift by my son when he was in college. Uh, yeah, like what a brilliant young man. <laughs> and, um, and, and I just loved it from beginning to end. And I saw myself in these different archetypes that really helped me to understand myself better and to kind of grow through um, challenges. And so much so that I've used this book in my professional practice. Um, Oftentimes I see women, they show up and, you know, because of the patriarchal world we were born in, sometimes being born into a female body isn't comfortable for a lot of us. And we don't always know why. So I've given this book to women and I've said, go find your goddess in it. And they come back and they just, it just opens up a world of wisdom to them that they didn't really understand about before. And it really helps us to kind of like, okay, what can I take that um, helps me to grow? And what can I leave behind that I don't need that story anymore? So uh, who was your goddess? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think I did resonate with Aphrodite more as a younger woman. Um, you know, she's the goddess of love. But Jean also talks about how um, sometimes when we embody Aphrodite energy when we're young, and I did, that that can get taken advantage of. And that was um, part of my story with my child sexual abuse trauma that I suffered. Um, and so I've learned to embrace what's powerful about Aphrodite and leave what I don't need. And so that was a great healing for me. And then also, um, I resonate now in my older age more with Athena and Artemis. So um, Athena being like the warrior goddess and also being the strategist, right? So I'm, I'm great at strategizing and organizing and really, you know, putting plans into action. And then Artemis being, you know, kind of the, the one who is, um, woke and just like, you know, calls, calls, calls bullshit <laughs> on what needs to be called. Right. So no bullshit. Yeah. With our yeah. 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 When did that book come into your life? Well, um, yeah, my son was in college. So he's now, um, you know, had his master's degree. So that must have been almost 10 years ago. Right. That's, yeah. that's quite a time then to wait to get to the point where you can leave some of that earlier trauma behind. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the trauma, um, I'm always evolving from it. I'm always growing. So it's like I'm always learning new things about how it shows up within my within me, within my relationships. And again, like what's the wisdom I can take and what is it that I don't need anymore? And that's, you know, it's a part of who I am. So again, like with the many facets, it's like, I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to um, turn my back on it. I mean, that that young child who was wounded has led me to this deeper um, 
you know, experienced this depth in my life that now I can help others. And so I don't want to abandon her. Like what she went through is so vitally important to where I stand today. Mm. Well, your 10th book, I mean, it does touch on this subject, uh, it focuses on this subject, The Courage to Heal, a guide for women survivors of child sexual abuse by Ellen Bass and Laura Davis, which was published in 2008. Mm. Tell us about this book. And, uh, you know, obviously, you've got a personal relationship with this topic mm. and how it helped you. Yeah. Yeah. And when I first, when it first came to me to put on the list, again, I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, but you know, it's not really a spiritual book, but it is. And um, yes. So, so Ellen Bass and Laura Davis, they're both writers and poets and um, they, I, they saw the need to put together a collection of women's voices, simply talking about child sexual abuse. And so each woman gets to tell their story. And, and it's really the first and maybe really the only one of its kind that's that's done in this way. I mean, it's a huge volume. It's like, you know, you know, I don't even know how many pages, but it's huge. And for me, it was like having this Bible in my hands of all these women with this collection of, of not only trauma, but of wisdom and of, um, survival, right? So one of the things the book taught me is we don't see ourselves as victims. We see ourselves as survivors. So, you know, when I'm, when you're a victim, you're sort of still stuck in it. And, and for some okay. people that might be true on the path until they evolve. But when you break through and you become a survivor, you can own it and you can help other people heal. And that's what this book did. And, um, you know, I know Ellen personally, again, I've done workshop with her. I've studied with her. I was so lucky to be in a women's um, writing group with her at her home in Santa Cruz. And again, this was many, many years ago. And um, just to have her and, and Laura on in our court, like just saying, you know, yes, what you experienced is real. Yes, it was traumatic. And yes, you can heal from it. That was like all I needed to kind of like to move forward. And I've given this book to many women. Um, you know, this this book and their 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 wisdom, their work in the world started the Survivors Healing Center which is currently operating in Santa Cruz, California. And I send women there if they need help. And so it's really like, um, it's more than a book, it's a movement. And it really, it sparked this great movement. Yeah. Well, um, are they survivors themselves? So Ellen is not, but Laura is. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is something that is... Uh, desperately needs to be addressed um you know it happens to so many women and to men too yeah oh absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um you are a survivor of childhood trauma um and you say that you found your most important tool for healing in nature um mm -hmm. have you always had a love affair with nature yes well Again, I think when I was younger, I absolutely did, but I didn't know that that's what I was doing, if that makes sense. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey, which is called the Garden State, <laughs> but, you know, we did the Garden State Parkway, <laughs> the freeway. But yeah, my mom, my mom um, had rose bushes and my mom was really, um, without knowing it, she, she was sort of a naturist, you know, she, know, she didn't like to kill insects. She would scoop them up and put them outside. And, um, you know, just, being a child in the 70s, we spent a lot of a lot of time out of doors, whereas, you know, kids today don't so much. So I think I recall more like the fireflies, like, gosh, like being like in awe of like, what even is a firefly? It's a miracle. It's this bug that lights up. And yeah. And so um, I think as I got older, I more embraced flower energy and, and not only just the beauty of it, but the recognition that my my 
God, you know, we're, we're all here on this earth and flowers just grow. And the ones we call weeds often hold the most power as medicine. I mean, yeah, yeah, we could just name them on and on. I mean, it's just these are the precursors for a lot of even the pharmaceutical medications that we know. And um, so, yes, I think it was more as I was like a teenager, young woman, where I started studying herbalism. And then again, I had the Bach book. And um, I just really ran with it. And so now it's like, I can't even pass a flower by without getting down on my knees if I have to and really looking at it and seeing what it what it's trying to tell me. Why is it calling to me? And it makes me feel so good because I'm a teacher of, of flower energy that now whenever I meet with a client or a student and then I meet with them again a second time, they all say to me, I look at the flowers differently now. And that to me is everything because... Again, this is this is nature and this is the one source that nourishes us. And without it, we would literally be dead. <laughs> but spiritually, we would be deadened as well. And so it really brings us into a fuller um, lived life, I think. Mm. You say that you left behind an entertainment career and a lifetime of chronic pain to guide others. Um, what was the pivotal moment? that made you decide to leave that career behind and do different work? Yeah, well, my husband and I, we were um, doing um, entertainment production in the Bay Area, and we loved it. It was great. Um, I guess the pivotal moment is that it didn't really pay <laughs> very well. But um, but so we, we decided to close the business. And when we did, um, you know, I was a mother and I had a pretty fulfilling life. But what happened was that after we closed the business, um, I had this really mysterious um, illness where I had um, this horrible um, skin rash, eczema on both of my palms, and it traveled up both my arms, and then it traveled up my shins, and uh, nothing I had ever experienced before. And it was painful, like I had blisters on my hands. So I couldn't do anything, like I literally could not do anything. Um, and so I tried everything. I went to all different healers. I went to doctors, allergists. I took prescriptions. Nothing helped. And then it was like the light bulb went off. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be treating my emotions, right? Because <laughs> when you're depressed, you forget, you know. And so I went back to working with the flower remedies, which was kind of like square one. And I had been working with them before, but not really focused on like my physical ailment. Because when we have external, when we have physical stuff, we want something external to just fix it. I just wanted it to go away. And then I remembered that the way out is in, oh yeah, okay, I have to go inward. So I did. And um, I started using a few different remedies, which led me to understand that I was depressed. And um, once I kind of cleared the cobwebs out of the depression, I was like, well, okay. Um, you know, I, I realized that I'm a healer. I've always realized it. I've always studied herbalism and, you know, this, that was just always my passion. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to go back to that and maybe I could do it, you know, for others, maybe I could do it as a career. So um, I actually looked online and I looked to see if there were any flower essence classes. And, and these are for anyone who looks for flower essence classes, they're kind of few and far between. And um, what I found was there was a class starting within the next couple of weeks that was driving distance from my house. And it was like a six week flower essence class. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I joined the class and um, that was enough. That was confirmation for me to kind of go onward. So then I, after I did that little six week course, I went on with the box center to complete my box practitioner's training, which took about a year and a half. And um, I was also um, doing my health coach training at the same time. And so when I started health coaching, I started giving all of my clients uh, flower essences and what I noticed was that they were healing and progressing at a quicker rate than um, people who were doing just straight coaching. So again, I was sold. So what would you say is the main difference for you personally um, between bark flower essences and other flower essences? Well, they're 
all the same in that they catalyze the energy of each flower. And, um, you know, if you're working with a company that's done their due diligence and, and worked with years of research, then they can kind of discern what each flower is for. Um, you know, especially the Flower Essence Society in Northern California. I work with their essences as well because they have a great research program. Um, but with Bach, so he was the original, right? So I feel like, um, you know, to ground ourselves in the roots, pun intended, um, but then from there we can grow and aspire to more. So whenever I teach the art of flower therapy, I start with the Bach remedies. I don't end there. You know, I do teach other remedies, but I feel like to ground ourselves in the original wisdom really helps us to kind of understand what it is we're doing and know because so he like he cat he categorized the 38 flowers into seven categories of emotional challenge and those emotional challenge categories are still so relevant today like fear the first category is fear and it's so enlightening to discover the different ways fear shows up. So it's not enough to just say, I'm afraid of something, what can I take? Like what I want to guide people to do is to really reflect more deeply on where that fear arises and, and how it lands in you. And so like, what do you need to transform it? So for me and for all of my students, it's always um, a deeper experience in inner awareness, more so than in like memorizing a flower remedy and what it's for, right? Yeah. So tell me the other six categories. Uh, I might have to cheat. I might have to look in my book. So there's uncertainty. Um, there is oversensitivity. So that's like oversensitivity to external energies, despondency and despair, and that's four. I am going to look in my book. Loneliness. And loneliness is funny because there's only three flowers in loneliness. I always make a joke, but it's the lonely category. Um, oh, uncertainty, we said. Insufficient interest. Um, huh. Loneliness. Yeah, insufficient interest in present circumstances. So we see that a lot now when people can't focus, right? When you kind of like, you know, have like monkey mind. Um, oversensitivity is a big one, and that's it, despondency, despair. Oh, and overcare for the welfare of others. I love that one when we're just so concerned with either taking care of others or caring so much what other people think. So, yeah, all really super, super relevant today. Mm -hmm. um, let's, uh, let's tell um, our viewers a little bit more about the flower remedies because they are so amazingly helpful. I'll tell you a little personal story. Um, when my mother had a stroke, um, you know, she, she was beginning to get everything back. She was living alone, but I was there a lot, but not all the time. But she went into a depression and um, she used to like lemonade, you know, fizzy lemonade, like a, an American Sprite. That's English lemonade is very similar to that. And so I used to buy her bottles and I have to loosen the caps for her because she didn't have full use of her hand. I used to put the flower remedies for depression and anxiety into her lemonade because I knew that she would be drinking it when I wasn't there. And mm. um, it was a way of being able to give her something to help. Uh, help the condition. And, and it worked. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I love that. I love the idea that um, you don't even have to know that you're taking them for them to work. And there's proof in that every day because I, I use them on babies. I use them on animals. I've used flower remedies on plants. So like I had, um, I had a rosebush collection in a hot house when I lived in Northern California. And one day um, I noticed that there were aphids on the plant, on the, on the stem. Right. And so um, I gave the, the plant crab apple remedy, which is the cleansing remedy. So it helps when we have like external um, stuff that we feel kind of ooky about. And I gave it to the plant. I just dropped it right there in the soil and, the aphids went away. And I've used that really um, several times when I've had like bug infestations. And so like, how incredible is that? So it is, it is the subtle energy of the flower that we're using. And it is, it does contain powerful medicine. Um, 
much like homeopathy, right? It's very similar to homeopathy. And often when we're using the quantum essence, the most minute amount, it does have the greatest power to heal. I am. I have been using my rescue remedy, which is the only one I have with me while I'm mm -hmm. traveling on um, a mosquito bite that's been particularly irritating and it helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So mm -hmm. you um, you've produced the listening to flowers, which is uh, mm -hmm. your your guide. Um, tell us a little bit about the inspiration for the book. And uh, and, and it's a card deck as well, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it's yeah. a card deck as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was um, in my Bach training, um, you know, I was trying to remember the indication for each flower. And so um, I've always been sort of a poet, you know, I've always loved language. And so what I started doing was I started jotting down positive affirmations to go with each remedy, because that helped me to memorize, like ground myself into, you know, what it is that they provide. And so after um, I did this, and I started working with the affirmations myself. So each month, I'll, I'll make myself a little combination flower remedy formula. And then I would start reciting the affirmations that I designed. And I noticed that, wow, this really does help me to not only understand what it is that the flower provides, but to also recognize like what words don't resonate? Where do I get stuck? And so that would always direct me into like what the deeper work was that I needed to do. And so then um, I started asking some of my friends like, oh, do you want me to give you my affirmations that go along with the remedies? And they did and they loved it. And then I started giving it to clients. So whenever I got done with a client session, I would give them their formula and then I would give them affirmations that went with each remedy. And again, everybody was like, oh my gosh, I love this so much. These words mean so much. So it was like just another way to ground into the system and the healing. And um, yeah, so that's it. And then uh, and then <laughs> um, I worked with one of my friends who was also a student and a client, and she was an artist. And I asked her if she would want to draw each flower. And um, at the time, Audrey was quite young. I believe she was 20 or 21. And she said, yeah, I would love to do this. And we didn't get in each other's way. What we did is we decided that I was going to write the affirmations, you know, and she was going to draw the images. And then we were going to blend them together and kind of see, see what happened. And um, she did this. She kind of, she took, I think she took each remedy and then kind of drew intuitively. And she, you know, she knew the flowers, but she drew intuitively. And when we put them together, we were just in awe of like what a beautiful work of art it was. And I think that at first we were like, oh yeah, it's, it's, we're just going to make this a work of art. Like maybe we'll draw up a little prototype and just share it with people as, as a piece of art. But um, I think I saw a greater calling for it. And I asked her if it would be okay um, to submit it to different publishers. And um, so I did this. And it took, um, well, the whole work took seven years from start to finish. But it took about a year and a half to get it in a publisher's hands. And um, I, I was submitting it as a book, like as a little guidebook, a handbook, as it were. And um, the publisher that accepted it, Schiffer, um, they saw it as a, as a card deck because that's what they do. They make decks. But I couldn't yeah. be happier. I mean, it's so beautiful to be able to have each card and kind of lay them out. And um, yeah, and to just work with them in that tactile way. It's very beautiful. Interesting that it took you seven years, seven categories. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put that together before. <laughs> so um, you, um, you show readers how to use flower to set deeper intentions and gain greater self-awareness and mm. manifest empowered change. I can understand how they will gain greater self-awareness. What about, tell me about the setting deeper intentions. How does that work? Hmm. Well, I think that every time we, we speak something to the cosmos, whether it's in our true voice or our mind's voice, we're setting an intention, right? So too often we set negative intentions 
you know, why am I so stupid or why did I do that? Or, you know, or even blaming other people, you know, they did this thing and we get stuck in negativity. So I think that when we speak the positive, like I said, aloud or in our mind's voice, we're setting positive intention. We're setting an intention for growth. We're setting an intention. Um, maybe we don't even know like what the outcome is or how we have to go about it, but perhaps we're even setting the intention to be led down that path because, um, you know, sometimes we don't even know where our, our courage or our wisdom arises from, but it arises, right? And so it starts with a seed. So to me, the affirmation is sort of like, it's the seed, it's the seed of intention, as it were. Mm. Mm. And the manifesting empowered change, I mean, really, that's related to what you just said, isn't it? The very fact that you are setting an intention to grow is you know, transformation. Absolutely. And then like, you know, as a health coach and, and just as a spiritual seeker, I like to guide people and myself in really tracking, um, tracking the manifestation as it were, tracking the change. So again, it's like when you take a, a combination flower remedy, um, you know, I give it to my clients and they go home and they use it, they finish the bottle and that takes like three or four weeks. So it's about a moon cycle, right? And so in that change um, or in that time, we can kind of track like where was I at the beginning and where am I now? And then from there we can see, well, what, what do I need to do now to do more or how can I celebrate the change? And I feel like that that's really an important part of it in manifestation is um, not only like, you know, wanting something to catalyze, to emerge, but trusting that it will through the intention. And then there goes that law of least effort again, just kind of touching it and letting it go and letting the universe take charge. And then really reflecting on like, what is it that happened that really brought me into greater awareness and more empowerment? Mm. It's it's interesting. You um, you know, I can see that tracking the change could be really useful. I mean, you can keep a diary um, and track how your mood is changing through that period. Too often, you know, and I've done this myself, where I know that I need to take a remedy. I start taking the remedy. Then, you know, after a few days, I just start forgetting. And then I forget that I needed to take it in the first place. So, you know, it's worked, but I yes. haven't tracked it at all. And it is, it is a good idea to keep track. Yeah. And I think what you just described, I mean, you know, sometimes there's acute challenges that come up like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling irritable today, but I'm not always irritable. It's just, you know, I'm a little off. Mm -hmm. And so you can take the remedy that correlates to that irritability and then it might go away in a day or two. And maybe, maybe it's not so important to track then, right? Like it was just an acute challenge and it went away. But I think that, you know, I work a lot with chronic issues and trauma and physical ailments. And so in that regard, I do think celebrating our growth and seeing how we transcended the illness is so important to our ongoing, our ongoing growth and our ongoing healing. And so that's the tracking. So that's funny that you bring up journaling because, um, you know, I'm an avid journalist and I really do try to get all my clients to journal. But it's funny because I'll ask people, you know, do you journal? And, and most people do, many people do. And then I say, do you read back your journals? And like more than half of the people do not. And they say to me, no. And, and so, uh, you know, here's a trick. What, what I do is um, I ask them to go back on the new and full moon of each month and read back the prior two weeks. And that's where you're going to get all of the little aha moments, the reflections and the wisdoms that are going to carry you forward. So again, it's tracking the change. Mm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite remedy? I mean, I know oh, many people would go straight to rescue remedy because it is a bit of a catch-all, but do you have a favorite amongst the others? So, I mean, I have a few that I feel like are my personal remedies, but I think that I really, really love impatience, the impatience remedy. So much like the name suggests, it's for a state of feeling impatient. 
Um, you know, I'm a really quick thinker and I can move really fast, um, both mentally and physically ahead of others. And so sometimes when we're moving quickly ahead of others, we might get caught up in feeling annoyed. <laughs> you know, it's one of, it's actually one of the flowers in the loneliness category, because sometimes when we're moving too quickly, we find ourselves alone. You know, and, and I can see either physically or spiritually. So that has been a remedy that's really helped me to kind of bring it back to center. And one of the affirmations for that one is I sail along effortlessly in the perfect stream of time. And for me, the affirmation has become the medicine that I can catch myself when I'm moving too quickly. I can take a breath and just say that sentence and it brings me back. So I don't even have to take the remedy anymore. And um, that's the other thing, like when we have certain flowers that resonate deeply with our, um, our let's just say our ways of being, like, like I'm never not going to be a quick person. That's part of who I am. I don't want to eradicate that. But of course, I don't want it to trip me up. So I want to just kind of know when I need to bring it back to center. Mm, yeah. That's a good one. I find myself ch um, taking chestnut a lot. White chestnut for overthinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. probably yeah. the most that's popular true. one. <laughs> yeah, because we've all, I mean, I think we've all experienced all of it, but I think yeah. we're, you know, we're humans, so we're intellectual beings. And um, we can get caught in overthinking and over-intellectualizing and worrying. And so, yeah, to just be able to, like, drop out of your mind and into being is such a gift. Mm. So many people are feeling so many emotions right now. Um, mm -hmm. Anxiety, fear, um, you know, all of it at once because we are living in an unprecedented time. If there was one remedy only that people could take to help them navigate this time, what would it be? I have two that are coming up, but I'm gonna I'm going to say Holly. I'm going to say Holly because Holly is the heart opener. So what Dr. Bach saw in this flower was that when we have a closed heart, right, we're unable to connect with humanity and really with the greater good that is within each of us and how, how do we spread that to others. So it's the one for the, he calls them the feelings of vexation. So when there's hatred, when there's anger, um, you know, when there's resentment and, and just like all these feelings about others or about the world that are so negative, um, our heart is closed. And so, you know, what heart attacks are like, I think maybe they're the number two now, um, just the, the reason for death. And it's like that speaks so much to a closed heart. And even those of us who think we're spiritual beings or think we're compassionate beings, you know, we could be in traffic and someone cuts us off. And before you know it, you're hating that person without even knowing them. And sometimes we get self-righteous. We think it's okay to be angry at people if they're hateful. Well, okay, is is hate going to cure hate? I don't think so. And sure, that's a really, really hard move. Like when we see so much destruction and so much violence, you know, we want to be, um, you know, on the side of good and we want to see what's bad about those who are bad. But I think Holly, you know, especially if we could give them to the people who are doing, we could give Holly to the ones who are doing destruction. I do believe that would just open up the heart space of the universe. But also for those of us who are doing good work, I think sometimes the closed heart, we get caught in that. And so, uh, yeah, I think Holly is the elixir of our time. Yeah, I think you're right. And, you know, wouldn't it be a great idea if all of the governments of every country were to add it to their water? Yeah. And one of my prayers I say every morning, which is a Buddhist prayer, is may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And then I always add the holly part to me is may all who create suffering find their golden heart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, do you do any uh, courses just to introduce people, you know, uh, online courses so that they can get familiar with the remedies? 
Yeah, I absolutely do. And, um, you know, I wish I did them more often, but that said, I'm, I'm going to do my, um, my Bach Essentials class again in the fall. It's an eight week course, so it takes a lot of my time. So it's hard to find the eight consecutive weeks, but that's phenomenal. And I've had people take it who didn't even know what flower essences were. I've had people take it who've been working with flower essences for years. And everybody says the same thing, that it teaches them more about themselves. And then it really teaches them how to work with the remedies, um, not only for themselves, but you know, helping to prescribe for others. So that's a really groundbreaking class that I think everyone should take. Um, but I also have- Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I also have a monthly flower circle. And um, this one is really great. And um, so what we do is I'll guide everyone. We'll, we'll use one emotional challenge every month. And then I'll guide everyone through a guided visualization practice. And as a, as a certified hypnotherapist, this is kind of where I help people to kind of ground into the challenge and discover what awareness is they need to take from it. And then we talk about the flowers that support that emotional challenge. So um, yeah, it's really, it's really a lovely group. And, you know, whenever the people show up, it's just always the right combination of people. And we help each other, mm -hmm. witness each other. Yeah. Well, you know, as is fairly obvious from the conversation, I am a great fan of bark flower remedies. And I do think that everybody should have a kit in their cupboard because, you know, you've got everything you need right there. Great yeah. for kids. You know, pre-exam nerves, broken heart syndrome, all of those. I've used them for everything. All of it. Nightmares, um, studying, right, because school's a hard one <laughs> for a lot of children. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, Dina, thank you so much for adding your 10 best list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's Library of Recommendations. Mm, thank you, Sandy. What a pleasure. It's listening to flowers, positive affirmations to invoke the healing energy of the 38 bark flowers. The book and the card deck by Dina Salisi is illustrated by Audrey Violet and published by Red Feather Books, which is part of Shiffa. For more information about Dina's book, blog, classes and free circles, visit dinasalisi.com. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 Best Interview on the BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and thank you again to Dina Salisi. <laughs>